Welcome to the Dynamic Leaders Podcast, a product of Talent 409. I am your host, Colin Cernelia. Thank you for joining us today. Go to talent409.com to learn more about how we can help your team or organization with their leadership and culture development. This podcast is available on Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play, Radio.com, iTunes, and Apple Podcasts. Please consider taking a minute in on Apple Podcasts, giving us a five-star rating and review. Doing this helps other dynamic leaders find us, and it helps us find other dynamic leaders. And don't forget, you can now ask Alexa to play your favorite Apple Podcasts on any Amazon-enabled device. Just say, Alexa, play the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. Getting Dynamic Leaders with Colin Cherniglia from Apple Podcasts. On to today's guest I have with me, Tessa Felix. Tessa is the Culture HR and Operations Lead at PWL Capital in Ottawa, Canada. Tessa is also a former student athlete competing in volleyball at St. Mary's University. Tessa is passionate about team performance and is always looking for innovative ways to improve employee engagement and happiness and i promise you that shines through throughout the course of our conversation today so let's get right into this and let's discover our talent altitude here is my talk with tessa felix Today on the line with me, I have Tessa Felix. Tessa, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you so much for the opportunity and having me on the show. Absolutely. I'm so glad to have you. And I'm curious. So a lot of folks come to this show and they want to grow in their leadership. I call it discover their talent altitude and they want to stretch and go the extra mile. From your experience, you are in the HR world, and we're going to dive into this a little bit more further on in the conversation. But from your experiences and your expertise, what do you see are one or two common attributes or traits that leaders have when they go the extra mile for someone? It's a great question. And I think everything comes back to personal accountability, right? And, you know, what what does personal accountability even really mean? And I think, you know, there's kind of these four factors that really contribute to someone being really high in personal accountability. And, you know, that's, it's resilience, right? It's ownership, it's continuous learning. um, And it's this, this kind of constant drive to really see where you can add value and kind of help people be the best versions of themselves, right? Without judgment and, kind of just coming back to that thought of, you know, what can I do to help, right? As opposed to falling into judgment or drama, something like that. Sure. Absolutely. And I can, (laughs) it's so funny. I try try not to use John Kennedy for a bunch of examples, but he is someone I know really well. And one of his, his famous quotes from his inaugural address here in America was asked not what you not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And that personal accountability reminds me that, I think we all can take a step back and look, life's hard. We're not going to debate that, but I think there are a lot of positives and there's a lot of things that you can do as an individual and take the accountability to grow yourself is probably step number one that a lot of us just simply don't get to. So I love that you pointed that out. Nice. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Great start. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, Tessa, so I want to give you an opportunity as I do with all my guests to tell the listening audience a little bit about yourself. So please tell us, who are you? Yeah. So my name is Tessa Felix. I'm from Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada, and I currently live in Ottawa. Um, I'm a former varsity volleyball player, and I'm currently the culture, HR, and operations lead for a wealth management team at PWL Capital Inc. Beautiful. So a lot to 
unpack there. And I usually like to start my conversations talking about athletics because the majority, if not all, I think of my guests have had some type of athletic background to some level of competition. And you are no different. You mentioned you played volleyball grew up, I'm sure, around sports in some capacity in general. But can you tell us a little bit about what that journey was like? Specifically, let's stick with volleyball to start because that's where you played at the highest level. So how how did that all come about? Was volleyball something you grew in love with pretty early on in life? How did that all happen? Yeah, well, I mean, backing it up uh, even just a bit before my athletic career, um, when I was younger, I was diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia. So, you know, as a kid, academics, learning was always a bit of a struggle for me in kind of the traditional school setting. And although I didn't realize it at the time, right, that diagnosis was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me, right? I started to realize, okay, like, you know, if I want to be successful, I just have to put more work in, right? I just have to put in more effort. And I started to think about like these topics in about school in different ways. And, you know, around grade nine, I started to develop my own kind of routines for studying, right? I saw the benefits of working hard and I started to do well in school and I just found more creative ways to understand these complex topics. And although I struggled and it took a while for me to really embrace that reality, I developed the mentality that I wasn't going to let that define me. So bringing that experience into sports, right? Like I was always involved in something like jazz, tap, ballet at a young age, right? I kind of grew out of that pretty quickly though. And I started to play field hockey. And after that season, a lot of my friends would play club volleyball. So I obviously want to be with my buddies, I want to be with my friends and I tried it for the team. And, you know, all of my, all my really good buddies are on the A team, right? They've been playing for a few more years than me. And so I tried out, got cut from the A team and, uh, but I made the B team and I won't lie. Like I was pretty, ter- pretty terrible at volleyball when I first started. <laughs> and, you know, that summer, after that that year being on the B team, I just before the next round of tryouts, I you know instead of kind of having fun and hanging out with my friends um, outside of that, like I, I spent all my time in the gym, right? Whether that was like passing against the wall, practicing my arm swing, right? I would ask my parents to kind of come come down to the gym with me and toss balls, right? Serve at me, and then it, when it came out came to tryouts the next year, I ended up making the A team, and I was still really behind skill wise, right? I was super awkward physically, and I mean, I'm not the most natural athlete for volleyball at the time, but uh, like I think it was in yeah grade nine, and I was about just under, or I was about six feet tall. So my coaches kind of saw that potential, and I started to relate my experience with ac- academics to athletics, right? A lot of my friends were naturals, right? Sports came easy to them. And yeah, sports came um, really easy to them in high school. And I wasn't really in the same boat when it came to volleyball. So which caused me to find, again, these other ways to be successful. So I would think like, you know, if I couldn't add value to the team skill wise yet, right, how could I be a better teammate? Like where else could I add value? If it wasn't a starter, or should I just like sulk on the bench and like feel sorry for myself? Or should I add value by being super positive, loud and supportive teammate? I mean, I won't lie, like I didn't always have the best attitude. Like there are times when I let my ego and my <laughs> emotions get the best of me, right? Whether it's having, you know, bad body language or not being as supportive as my teammates as I could. And actually, I just read Christine Porath's book, Mastering Civility. And I wish I knew back then the impact that microaggressions and like uncivil behavior can have on other people. Like I would have been a much easier player to play with in high school. But my coach said something that always sticks out. She said, what are you doing when you don't have the ball? And like, are you getting into the best position possible in defense? Are you calling out, you know, the seam um, for your blocker, for your, for your hitters? And, and are you communicating on service seat? Are you communicating if the, you know, the hitters are swinging the line or cross? So do you have a great attitude on and off the bench? Like how else can you add value when you don't have control of the ball? So regardless if you're a star player or you're on, you know, on the bench, like you can always find places to have value. So it's kind of my, the, the initial experience and, you know, putting a ton of time in outside of practice into my game, I eventually started to catch up, right? I started to be a starter, a top player on, on my team. And I made the, we call it provincial team in Canada. So team British Columbia, uh, three years in a row. And I started getting, you know, recruiting letters from schools in Canada, some schools in uh, division one schools in the States, and that extra effort was really starting to pay off. And, you know, my identity was so wrapped up in being a volleyball player, right? It's all I cared about. So and kind of at the same time, I guess I was also a competitive rower in high school. It came a bit more natural to me. And I started getting recruited by schools like University of Washington, which is where my dad went. My dad rode crew for them. And 
other schools in the States. And you know, my grade 12 year, I kind of had to make a decision, right? Like about my university career, did I want to row? Did I want to play volleyball? And what was my passion? I ended up playing volleyball uh, for, for two different universities in Canada on a scholarship. So you obviously overcame some personal adversity, not only in sport, but in academics as well. And we're able to, I think that's really cool how you identified that what, what you learned as the best practice for you in academics, you could take that into competition too, and really helped you end up thriving to the point where you played at the collegiate level. And yeah, yeah, so I think that's, that's an important takeaway to highlight from our conversation is the personal adversity and and the fact that you came over that. Now, when you decided that you wanted to play at the collegiate level, you mentioned having opportunities both in Canada and in the United States, what ultimately took you to where you ended up? Like, was it something about the culture fit? Was it something about the academic opportunities? Why did you decide to go where you went? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a bit of both. The school, Simon Fraser University, where I, where I first first attended on, on scholarship, um, fantastic academic program. I took psychology in university, which is my passion, and um, just a, a great group of teammates. Um, three of the girls, actually, I think four of the girls that got scholarships to Simon Fraser, I right, also played with them on Team BC. So it was like super solid group of girls, and we were really excited to, to play together and have that university experience. Um, I did end up transferring to a different university, the Simon Fraser University, this first school that I was at. They actually transferred to the NAIA, which is a division in the States. And I, I, I wanted to kind of stay in Canada. And so I contacted another coach um, across the country and ended up, he was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. We'd love to have you on the team. And it kind of worked out that way. Very cool. It's so funny when a lot of us, we get to the collegiate level and, I think I'm I'm including myself in this conversation. We get the opportunity to play collegiately and you had mentioned your identity being so wrapped in volleyball and my identity was at that point in my life so wrapped around baseball. But I think I knew in the back of my head, even though I didn't want to admit it at the time that that was my last stop to play competitive baseball. And a lot of us get to that collegiate level and whether it's because of opportunities or because we're not good enough to play, whatever it may be, we know in the back of our head that that's our last stop, but we're maybe not ready to fully let it go. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that transitional period was like for you when you finished up playing? Did you have any thoughts about continuing to play on after that? And how did you transition out of that identity? It's a really good question. And I think this is such an important topic that doesn't get talked about as much for um, university varsity athletes. And, you know, when I you know stopped my university career, it was like I had this great family, right? This amazing experience of being a competitive varsity athlete to not at all. And my identity was totally lost. Like when I graduated, I was like, I don't even know what I like outside <laughs> of volleyball. And I'm not going to lie. Like I was super lost. And, you know, if I can suggest something to, all of you who are currently competitive athletes is spend time self-reflecting and developing multiple things that bring you joy, right? Savor every second of your athletic career, but try to escape from the echo chamber and bubble that is being in university, that is being a varsity athlete. Because one day, right, for most of us, like that time is your is the time in your life is going to end pretty abruptly, and you want to do your best to set yourself up for success when that's all over. So, I mean, a lot of lessons, you know, after you, after you graduate, after you finish, I mean, did you have a similar kind of experience? What were your thoughts about that? Yeah, it was pretty abrupt. And I would say that I had passions outside of sports, but I didn't, I didn't know how to pursue them if that makes any sense. So like I, I loved, I loved politics, but I, and I was a political science major in school but I had no idea what I could do with that type of degree or like what I even wanted to do. Like I, it was, it was just a really weird period. Cause it's like you said, it, it ended pretty abruptly and it's like, okay, I guess I'm done playing the sport I, for baseball. I'd started when I was five. So, yeah. you know, very, very long time, but it, it's funny now being nine years later. So almost a, a full decade. <laughs> and yeah. you look back on it and you're like, man, I have, I've hopefully a long way to go in life moving yeah. forward. It's already been almost 10 years. Hopefully I have another you know, 30, 40, 50 years ahead of me. Like the time after you finish playing sport is 
usually going to be so much longer than your exactly. time playing it. It's just really hard in that moment, like you said. So I, I would yeah. say I would say that I, I would love to understand more how we can develop those passions, but like take it a step further and say, okay, so you have a passion for politics, for example, let's just use mine. How, how do we be practical and go and pursue those opportunities in the same way that we did in athletics? Like that yeah. is where maybe the disconnect is for a lot of folks. It's not necessarily that they, they don't like other things. They just don't totally. know what to do. <laughs> totally. And it's, I, I think there's so much power in building positive habits, right? Yes. And you can have all these things that you're passionate about, but if you're not doing like the smallest thing, you know, to pursue those habits every day, it's going to be pretty challenging. Right. So let's say, you know, I'm super passionate about, about reading. And, you know, after I read James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, like he talks about like the compounding effect of just doing the smallest little thing every day, right. Make it obvious. You know, I started like putting my book out on the table and just like reading (laughs) five pages a day. And then it's like, it's like compounding effects. So I think that's something that a lot of us after university can kind of take into consideration um, how, how to build great habits and understanding behavior change is something that I find pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. So let's dive a little bit deeper, I guess, into your personal experience. So you get out of school and you are a human being with a lot of other interests outside of volleyball and for let's just focus on your professional track. Did you get into HR right away or was that something that came along a little bit later? Yeah. I mean, again, good question. I mean, like, I guess I like bring it just back to sports just for a second, like balancing academics taught me a lot, like the importance of organization, time management, sacrifice, hard work, like learning from failure, the importance of mindfulness. And, but out of all of those experiences, I think the most important lesson was learning to leave my ego at the door, which is something that has the biggest impact on my professional career. And it's been incredibly important understanding how to be a leader and helping people be the best kind of version of themselves. So I can give you a bit of context um, about the financial advisor business in Canada. So Usually what happens is an advisor will hopefully you know, become an expert in their technical knowledge and be able to provide kind of stellar advice um, to their clients, which will ultimately help them you know, achieve their financial goals. And if their practice gets big enough, they need staff to support them, like operations admin, uh, traders, analysts, support advisors. So all of a sudden, this advisor has gone from managing clients to becoming a people manager which is a completely different ball game. So my role as kind of culture and HR lead usually doesn't exist in typical advisory firms in Canada. So kind of coming into this role, I had the opportunity to be completely autonomous and figure out kind of I'm still figuring out how to be a good people manager and kind of create an effective workplace culture. So I think, I know I, I actually started with PWL Capital as kind of a operations admin and, um, you know, was given this amazing opportunity to be, as we started to grow as a firm, um, to be autonomous and figure out how to be, figure out what, you know, what is great leadership? What is culture? And you know, I kind of did that by just learning from other ex- experts in the field, right? Just reading a ton, listening to podcasts, watching YouTube videos, reaching out to other leaders who've been successful and kind of try to figure out what their, their flywheel is, like how they get to where they are. So yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So before we dig a little bit deeper into what you're doing, I want to go back to the ego conversation because yeah. I think that's really an interesting topic. And I'm going to say you don't come off as somebody that has a huge ego. And I feel like I'm not somebody that has a huge ego either. But I think when I really want to dive deep into it, I can understand where ego has gotten in the way of some of my aspirations before and some of my relationships in the past. And that's without having like this huge ego that you need to, I don't know, be, be a head coach at a division one football program or be the uh, leader of your country, whatever it may be. Like there's, there's obviously differentiating levels of, of ego that we're talking about, but I'd love to learn more about how learning on your end what ego meant and how you could use it to improve yourself. Like what was that process like? And can you just dive into to it a little bit deeper for us? For sure. And I mean, like 
bring it back to sports a little bit. I, you know, when I started to kind of become a bit of a more influential, influential player on my team, you know, I, I didn't have, like I said, like sometimes let my emotions get the best of me, right. I didn't have the best body language. And my team captain came up to me and she said, Tessa, like, I gotta tell you something. I was like, Oh no, like what? She's like, people hate playing with you. And I was like, <laughs> Oh no. Right. Cause all of my like frustration was towards myself. Like I didn't want it to like show it of my, like reflect bad negatively on my teammates, but it was, it was having a huge impact. So that was my first kind of experience with like tough feedback. And I loved it. Like, Oh, I, it was tough at the beginning, but I was like, you know, that's a gift. Like I got to know when that's happening, especially on the court. So that's kind of my, my first experience of like, okay, I got to, I gotta park my ego and just be the best teammate that I absolutely can on the court. Can and I can I interject real quick? So of course. I, I just want to, if you can share it with us, yeah. what 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 was it about it that people didn't want to play with you? Like, were there specific aspects about the way that you yeah. like interacted with people? Was it? Can you dive in a little bit yeah. deeper on that? Yeah. Let's say like um, I hit the ball out. Like, I'd be like, oh my gosh, like, like I'd have this horrible look on my face, like terrible body language. Right. <laughs> and like when, um, just like I referenced Christine Porras book earlier about mastering civility. Mm -hmm. She says like, if people experience like microaggression or even if they witness a microaggression and I, I might be getting the data wrong here, but she says in the workplace, 80% of people will not be able to stop thinking about that event. 66% of people they they'll reduce their work efforts and 12% of people will quit their jobs. Wow. Like think about that. Then relate that back to the volleyball court, right? So I'm on the court. I just messed up. I have this horrible look on my face. Like I'm not helping my teammate get over that either. I'm making it way worse. So I think understanding that. And when you're an athlete, like kind of like fake it till you make it. Like if you're super mad at yourself for making a mistake, let go of it, get over it. Like that's gone right? Be in the present moment. And there's no point in wasting time and just like thinking, thinking about the past play, like you have to move on. So that was a big lesson. Yeah, absolutely. So I cut you off on where you were going yeah. to <laughs> go with, with some of those lessons that you learned. Yeah. So please continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. So eventually, um, after doing like a lot of research on, you know, what is culture? Like, I have no, what is that? Like, I got to figure that out. I eventually was introduced to this brilliant work of Cy Wakeman. So Cy is a drama researcher. She's a New York Times bestselling author, leadership consultant, and her philosophy completely changed what I thought great leadership was. And there are like many pieces of gold from her research and her books, but I can just share a few that kind of stand out to me. So in her research, she found the average American spends two hours and 26 minutes a day in drama right? That's like gossiping, tattling, venting, right? With their colleagues or, you know, that internal conversation that you're having with yourself, right? So like that, that amount of time, like that's massive, right? That's costing organizations a ton of money. So she also points out that, you know, great leaders, they don't tell people, they don't direct people, they don't order people. They tend to ask more questions than they give answers and they facilitate great thinking through self-reflection. And like the power of a leader, it's, it's not what you tell people to do, but it's what you get people thinking about. When I read that, I was like, what? Like, that's amazing. And she says that the new role of a leader is to eliminate emotional waste by facilitating better mental processes, right? Like when I thought about it, I was like, that challenges every conventional wisdom I thought about leadership. So, you know, we've been told as leaders that it's our job to motivate, engage, like make people happy. but when you really think about it, and you look at the research, motivation, engagement, happiness, that's a choice, right? So putting that on leaders is almost an impossible task. And I mean, Daniel Pink talks about this in Drive, like it's the data's there. And I just, Sai puts this, put it, puts it in this like beautiful framework. So let me ask you this question, Colin, like, have you ever had like a really clunky, messy, almost wasteful kind of workflow? Like, what do you do to improve to make that better? What do you think? Oh, good question. I, well, yes, I have had bad workflows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like something messy, like something that's not like efficient. Like what would you do to make it better? Yeah. So for me personally, I, I would try to clean it up. And when I say clean it up, I mean, take steps out of it maybe. 
Uh, a lot of times for me personally, when things get a little bit clunky is because they're too rigid, like they're too okay. detail oriented. Uh, right. I know that may sound a little counterintuitive, but right. for me, being able to streamline my efforts seems to be something that is more effective. So Beautiful. when whenever I'm getting bogged down, it's usually because I'm trying to do like a million different steps yeah. here and there. And I just need to let go of some of that and just get from point A to point B more efficiently. Exactly. You, 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 you implement a better process. So how do you get rid of emotional waste, like drama, judgment, venting in the workplace? The exact same way, but with a better mental process. It's the same thing. So I can't take credit for anything I just said there. Those are all <laughs> size words. Um, but the difference that that kind of mentality has had on our team is that people start to catch themselves when they're making assumptions and not focusing on facts, right? They're showing these incredible signs of resilience, right? They're not, if their weight isn't working, they're kind of using multiple resources to figure out an issue instead of giving up, right? Like, do you know the difference between persistence and the resilience? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know it, but I, yeah, just just describe it for, for everyone. I think that would be totally. helpful. So yeah, so yeah. persistence is like, you try you have like one way you try super, super, super hard to like make that way work, even though it's not right. Resilience is recognizing when your way is not working. And again, quoting size work here. And she says that resilient people often have two behaviors in common or two behaviors that really show it. it's like they have large groups of social networks and they ask for help early and often from that group, right? They're being resourceful, right? They're using all the resources that are available to them. Right. So the other thing is like, it's like with our employees, it's like instead of being resistant to change, they're hopping on board and embracing change. So understanding the power of seeing circumstances differently has made a massive difference on our team. Hey everyone, Christine here to talk about a sponsor of this show, my own business, Sweat With Stods. Head over to sweatwithstods.com to get the workout that suits your needs, whether you work out at home, in the gym, or you're brand new to fitness, there's something for everyone. Podcast listeners also get a special discount with code DYNAMIC at checkout, so be sure to head on over there after this. Thanks, and back to the show. When we had talked offline about the amount of time that goes into wasted drama, essentially, yeah. Yeah. It, it was really sickening to think about, like when you start to add that up and, and, and yeah. know that it's, it's a pretty common thing in work right. in workplaces and just in life in general. It's like, man, there, there's a lot of really good things out there that we could be focusing our attention to and probably right, lead right. to a lot more pro productivity and happiness, which would clean up those mental processes. It will just, <laughs> it will literally make things so much more fun. It really, right. it's, it's crazy when you're not focusing so much on making assumptions and creating these like stories, like, Oh, my coworker looked at me funny. She doesn't like me. Or, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, Oh my gosh, what are the facts? Like, let's get back to that. Yeah. yeah it reminds me, uh, I did a seminar recently about having difficult conversations and somebody asked me about how to prepare for like the emotional response to having a difficult conversation. So if that's in a workplace, if that's in a, a personal relationship, if that's on an athletic field, wherever it is. And I said to them, I was like, you'd be surprised actually how many times when you, when you force yourself to have a difficult conversation that it actually just alleviates whatever the issue was. Like if, if you ignore it, it's like a slow bleeding death. And it will just yeah. be there and it'll hover. It's like you say, Chester, like you, you're terrible. making, yeah, yeah. If, if you're making an assumption about the way somebody spoke to you or talked to you or looked at you at work versus just asking them why they did that, there may be a good reason for it. And if you just ask them, then you know. And there's not necessarily like this emotion that's attached to it that's going to drive you negatively or positively one way or the other. But that reminds me of why you should have difficult conversations is because you shouldn't be making judgments. You shouldn't be making assumptions. You should get the facts and move on, especially in a work setting where I think, and I, and I hate saying this because I am somebody that enjoys the social aspect of work. Uh, I do like being around other people, but I am more of the type of person that wants the work to be done. Like, I think it's very uh, black and white, like work is work. 
and social is social time. So uh, for, for, for there to be like any of this lingering drama for me, it really doesn't work. And I don't like to be in those types of of settings and those types of environments. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of conversation we can have around this and to your point, how we can improve it and just make it better for everyone. So I appreciate you bringing that all up. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about, what do you think about feedback? Yeah. What's your kind of, how do you deliver it? What's the best way to do that? Yeah. So feedback again, you want to be direct with it. Not so direct that you're coming off as a know-it-all or you're coming off like in a very harsh manner, especially if it's critical feedback. But I mean, everyone says that they want feedback, but then they get it and they tense up, like the wall goes up. So feedback, two things, be direct with it in a way that's, like I said, not harsh and not too critical if it is critical. But two, you have to be open and willing to actually changing. It's the it's the coaching of the work world, right? It's right. when when we're athletes, if we're not coachable, then we're never going to improve. And you can use coachable in in the work world too, but a lot of times you hear it as feedback. So if you can't take feedback and apply where your weaknesses are and where you're making mistakes, like managers and supervisors and bosses and leaders, whatever it is, they're not there to critique you. Trust me. That's the last thing they want to be doing. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they want yeah. to see you. Most people want to see you thrive and want to see you improve. They don't want to have to worry about you when you're at this big meeting or at this client meeting, whatever it is. So I think feedback is definitely an area where, yes, you need to take it personally, but you also need to have that openness, that openness, excuse me, and that willingness to apply it because if you if you're not going to have either of those two qualities then it doesn't matter how much feedback you get because you're never going to change so yeah it's a total gift like yeah we, yeah i think about it in a similar way and again just kind of using Sai Sai wakeman um she says that you know any feedback you get is in some way true sure in some way it's true yeah so and you know you you again, asking that question for self-reflection, like sometimes if I have to give, you know, some more challenging feedback to, you know, an employer, a teammate, I'll just ask that question. Like, how is that feedback I gave you true? And what's your role in this? Right. Cause then people can say, okay, like, yeah, maybe. Okay. I can, I can see, kind of see how that, yeah, yeah. I can kind of see that feedback's true. And what can I do to help and improve the, the circumstance of the situation? Right. Yeah. So have you read um, radical candor by Kim Scott? Yes. Yes. Like care personally, challenge directly. She has that amazing story where Sheryl Sandberg like gives her this like harsh feedback. <laughs> well, not harsh feedback. Yeah. She gives this like hard <laughs> feedback. She's like, you know, Kim, like you're, you're so great in that presentation, but you said I'm a lot. Then Kim's like, ah, yeah, it's fine. Right. <laughs> and then Cheryl's like, no, Kim, like you're not hearing me. You're super talented. I love what you do. But when you say I'm a lot, you sound stupid. Right. And she's like, Oh my gosh, like that got her attention. I mean, I don't want to call people stupid. Like I, I find that a bit harsh, but, but you can see, right. The benefit of like care, care personally challenged directly. Super interesting. Yeah. And, and I think one of the other important highlights before we move on from this, that you brought up was you make it a two way conversation, right? It's, yeah. it's in the same way when you're having a difficult conversation, it's not necessarily like an ultimatum one way or another. It's just difficult in the sense that it may be a sensitive topic. And when you're giving feedback, it may be difficult because it's critical. But make sure that you're going into if it's a one on one, if it's a meeting, whatever it is where you're interacting with that person, that you let them know that you are receptive to their feedback as well and that you want to have an open dialogue with them. So offering offering them the opportunity to not, not necessarily rebuke what you have to say, but offering them the opportunity to explain where they're coming from and their perspective and ask questions, try to get more detail into how they can do better because that that's ultimately what's going to, I think, speed up the process, but also allow for a better working relationship, which is ultimately, I think, what you're trying to get out of it is develop those relationships. Yeah. And like, you're almost doing a disservice if you don't give somebody feedback, yeah. right? You got to let them know. And like something, something that we're going to implement next year in our team is after you know, we have kind of senior advisors and more junior advisors. And after every client meeting that we have, they're both going to give each other two way. It's like a two way model of feedback. So it's like one thing that was great. One thing that could be different. And that's going to happen like right after every meeting. So it's that immediacy, that directness. It, I think it really helps with growth. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Let's talk about I have some, I have something specific I want to get to. 
your industry is probably a little bit more transactional. When you, when you look at it overall, it's probably a little bit more transactional than anyone wants it to be. I think there's a lot of talk and I've been in this industry before, so I, I'm talking from my personal experience and maybe it's a little bit different where you are, but I know there's always a lot of talk about relationship building or dealing with money in the first place. So there's a, a heightened <laughs> level of, of urgency when it comes to be able to establish a, a good working relationship with an advisor of some sort. Right. What I'm interested in is how in an industry that may be more transactional than not, do you switch that cultural perspective to be more relationship focused and to be more caring than be more cl- caring like with a client or in client meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. or just, just in general, I think it's probably a bad stereotype and a bad thing that, that this and industry this is. This industry is rife with conflict and negative negativity and bias. It's a, it's, it's there, right? That's a reality. Sure. Yeah. Totally. So, so yeah. It, it just, from your perspective and in, in the work that you have to do, I'm sure there's a little bit of cutting through that you have to do to, to reach those folks that do just want to be transactional and make a ton of money and don't really care about the cultural perspective of everything. So can you talk about maybe some of the challenges that you encounter yeah. because of that? Yeah. So, I mean, our model is a bit different. So we're, we're not pushing or selling any product like we don't have any in-house product that's going to give us this like massive commission like we don't do that at all our investment philosophy is you know depending on the client's risk um you know what they're what they're willing to be exposed to in the market um the investment philosophy is usually very streamlined across all clients so that conversation like trying to sell product never happens on our team okay um we're more interested in the financial planning aspects so our employees aren't coming on to make commission and push product and sell. We don't have sales quotas. That's not what we're about. Um, it's more about what is the absolute best thing that we can do for our clients. And we, we do that by having a focus on academic rigor. Um, so we have an evidence-based um, investment philosophy, which I'm not an expert in, so don't, be, don't ask me <laughs> to explain it. Um, but uh, that, I think that makes a big difference, especially for our employees, right? There, there isn't this constant, like, you know, eat what you kill atmosphere. It's everybody's here. We have this amazing structure of a team that's built for scale. And they kind of that removing that sales aspect from the culture. I mean, I think it just, you don't even think about it. So yeah, we would only kind of hire somebody who truly believes in that philosophy. And uh, I think that, yeah, like that from that question, it kind of eliminates that, that negativity that comes with being unethical and, you know, pushing product on clients that isn't actually right for them. From your perspective, then, when you have an employee, so it, lo- it looks like there's some steps that your company takes to make sure that you're bringing in good people with char- high, high levels of character, empathetic people, people that want to build relationships. So you might not have to work as hard to, <laughs> to get yeah. through to, to some of these folks. But when they first come to you and your job as, as a culture leader and as an HR professional, what are some of those first aspects and some of those first conditions that you have to expose them to and help them maybe understand a little bit more than they were accustomed to at another place or if this is their first job? So like, what are some of those first steps towards getting acclimated to your company? Yeah. I mean, so I think the, the onboarding process of employees is incredibly important, right? Like you think of comparing to like a client relationship, right? That first impression and like, building trust like people will like will judge you and have that first impression within like seconds of like looking at you right so that first impression is so important so the onboarding process with us it you know it's it takes well it's over you know six months i think it takes like six months to a year for somebody to be really kind of acclimated to a new workplace culture like it's not just oh yeah three days like and you're done it takes time it (laughs) takes a lot of effort and um you know things that we that we look for when we're, when we're hiring are, you know, again, personal accountability, again, using Cy Wakeman's words, it's the holy grail of being emotionally inexpensive. So I think, you know, the recruiting piece we have, um, we kind of, we're starting to attract people who understand what we're doing more. We have um, a podcast and YouTube videos that are kind of gaining some steam and getting some speed and people are reaching out to us like, Hey, like I saw your podcast. Like I really love your investment philosophy. Um, can I have an interview? So we're kind of starting to attract and recruit talent that way. 
which has been pretty exciting. It's been kind of a new thing for us. Sure. And, you know, so from there, you know, people go through that a kind of a, an interview process, right? It's, is it, are you a good culture fit? That's mm-hmm. the most important thing. And then you kind of do a technical deep dive of their skills and what's their knowledge. And, and then from there, it's, it's, you know, emotional intelligence, all, all of those sorts of things. And then from there, there's, yeah, the, the, the onboarding and, um, you know, I take everybody through again, Cy Wakeman's reality-based leadership workshop and everybody kind of is on the same page about how we think about circumstances and reality and all of that. So yeah, but still work in progress, right? Like I find, I find the interview process, I find hiring, it's challenging because people present the best version of themselves in an interview. So I don't sure. know, do you have, do you have suggestions about hiring and asking the right questions and all that? <laughs> Something I struggle with a bit. Yeah. Uh, great, great question. It, it is nearly impossible to totally understand somebody after one or two interviews, if that's on the phone, if that's in person, because again, like you said, you're, you're getting most times you're getting the best version of somebody in there prepared and and they know what they want to say and they know the examples that they can give. And so you don't totally understand. So I think from my perspective, what has been helpful in the hiring world has been asking them questions about their professional aspirations, like in an ideal world. So not, so, you know, it's the worst interview question in the world. And I don't, I don't ask it. And I, I encourage people if you are asking it to stop asking it, but the whole, I'm to hear what it is. yeah, the whole, where, where do you see yourself in five years is the worst question that you can ask wow. somebody because okay. all employers want to hear is that you're going to be with them, that you're going to grow. It doesn't, it doesn't give you anything. It doesn't tell you right. anything. <laughs> anyone, yeah, anyone can say that. So instead of asking that question, you take away the context of being with XYZ company and you say, okay, in an ideal world, what are you looking for? Don't put a timestamp on it. Just say like, what type of job do you want? What type of role are you looking to be in? Like, what are what are the things that you like to do? So you start on the professional scale. And a lot of times that'll open them up a little bit to even talk about things that are important to them personally. And it just gives the whole, I think the original intent of the question, a little bit more meaning to it. So you can understand like, is this somebody that is resilient? Like, have they overcome some adversity? And you'll be shocked some of the stories that come by asking that question. And it seems very general, but by putting some loose terms on it like that and not narrowing somebody down into this this little box that they feel like they need to fit in, they're going to be more willing to open up to you. Whereas if you say, where do you see yourself in five years? They're thinking, oh my God, all they want me to say is I'm going to be here. I'm going to grow and and that's it. So they're not actually thinking about what's important for them. So, and and that can, and that can really help you. And I've, I've seen it happen on both ends. It can help the employer. So the person who's interviewing the candidate, it can help them understand if they're good from a cultural perspective, but it can also help the candidate understand if what they're actually getting themselves into is something that they want to do. So it'll give them an opportunity to actually reflect on is this something I really want to do? Is this a company I want to be a part of? Because, and it's perfectly okay if it's not, sometimes it doesn't work out. And you would rather it not work out on the front end like that than bring somebody in only to find like six months later that it was probably not the right thing to do. Totally. Yeah. You put that perfectly. Yeah, (laughs) it's great. Yeah. So I want to stick, I'm really glad that we got onto the topic of hiring, I want to ask you about non-traditional methods that you're using to attract candidates. And I think you know from an HR perspective that being able to build that funnel and have a have a strong funnel of potential candidates that you can always refer to and always go back to. So like it, it's relationship building 101, right? It's not post a job, hire somebody. It's how can we attract people that want to be a part of our organization? Even if we don't have a job for them right now, we want to have conversations with these people because maybe we'll create a job for them. Maybe three years down the road, so-and-so leaves and this position's open and I've been in touch with John or whoever it is, and he's a great fit. And Susie over here knows 
this other person. So it's, it's all about relationships and referrals. And I think the non-traditional ways that you are trying to att- attract candidates is so amazing because all I ever hear from employers is that they are doing indeed monster career builder, LinkedIn. I'm like, those things are important, but you're really not going to find for the most part exactly what you're looking for by just scouring job boards and looking for people who are looking for jobs. You want to interact with the best of the best and the people that want to learn, for example, like the people that are true leaders because leaders know that their learning is never done are people listening to podcasts like this. Yeah. So if totally. your if your company is putting out a podcast and there is somebody interacting with it and learning and listening to it, then you already know right away that that is somebody that fits what you're looking They're for right? without yeah without even having to look at what a piece of paper says. It's right. it's, it's learner right again yeah. one of those factors of accountability. It's it's cool. Yeah yeah, yeah. so I I know I was ranting a little bit there, but no, I, no, I love it. It's I'd love right. for you to tell us a little bit more about some of those non traditional approaches that you're taking sure. and where those sure. ideas originated from. Yeah, I mean again it's using all the resources you have available to you. Like yeah, indeed LinkedIn for sure that's a resource. Great. But it's also your your reputation in the community, your reputation with your with your clients. Even we've had actually a few employees find us because one of our clients posted an ad on Facebook saying like we had you know this job available. Like so, having good relationships with your clients, building relationships in the community. Right, we have in Ottawa. There's Carleton University, University of Ottawa, Algonquin College. Um, we have all of these great programs, and you build build relationships with those schools. Right, who are the career counselors there? Like. Let me send my job, my job descriptions there, right? So it's building those relationships in the community. Um, yeah, great relationships with, with clients and having them be comfortable enough to send, you know, their friends and family to apply for jobs. Um, and the other, you know, there's there's other things too, like like we talked about the YouTube videos, the podcasts. I mean, the intention wasn't like to get great talent attracted. Like it was more just to get the message about, you know, our philosophy on investing and just kind of really start to pick up steam and, and and again, it's like, you have to think like, what am I not doing that I should be doing? <laughs> so it's like, how, how do you figure that out? And I mean, I think those kind of non-traditional ways of finding people have kind of, they've really paid off. I mean, we've, we've grown from when I, when I started with PWL, I'm starting my seventh year in January 1st, actually. And when I started, we had a team of four people and now we're almost 20. So it, we've grown quite a lot. I mean, that's, a, that's big growth for a private wealth management team. Yep. Um, it, you know, when you compare it to kind of banks, it's nothing, but for our space, it's, it's a lot of growth. And, you know, we've, we've had virtually no turnover in seven years. Yeah. I think that definitely speaks to the type of people that you're bringing in, but also the environment that you're creating for them to be a part of, because I talk about this all the time. Culture is the people that you're surrounded by and the experiences yeah. that you have together. That's what culture is. It's not this like buzzword that you just put up on, on a board. Culture is literally the experiences you have with the people that you're surrounded by. So if it's you're bringing fluid. in, yeah, right. And if you're bringing in the it's right fluid. people and you're bringing in or you're bringing them into an environment that will cultivate the type of learning and the type of growth that can help them advance in their careers and their personal aspirations, it's going to more often than not be a win-win for everybody involved. Totally. totally, And it's so important, right? The people that you bring onto your team, it's going to change your culture, mm-hmm. right? Culture is the attitudes, skills, and behaviors that people bring to work. It's your actions. Like you said, like, yeah, we could have integrity, trust, respect, like <laughs> written on the walls. Honestly, like, yeah, th- that's great. Those are awesome. But those don't matter. Like they're there. You can value that. But it's what are you bringing to work every day? Because that is going to dictate your culture. Your culture changes from day to day. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, man, I, I wish I wish we had hours and hours where we could Same. just, <laughs> just talk yeah, talk forever and uh, just nerd out on, on all of this. It's been such a, an amazing conversation. So before we wrap up, I just want to touch on a few things. And the first is if people enjoyed this conversation, which I'm sure they did, and they want to interact with you or learn more about the company, where can we find you on social media? 
Um, social media. Oh my gosh. Well, LinkedIn is probably the easiest way. I'm not, not huge on Facebook or Instagram um, or Twitter, as you kind of found out when you first reached out to me. <laughs> um, yeah, so LinkedIn is probably the best thing. And you can visit uh, also www.pwcapital.com, uh, pass more team. And uh, you'll, you'll see me there and you can reach out to me that way. Beautiful. Okay. I will get that. I'll, I'll put your LinkedIn and okay. the website in the show notes for yeah. people for easy reference. So any anyone listening can just go right there to find you. So totally. the show is called Dynamic Leaders. And obviously you're on the show as a dynamic leader yourself. And you showcase that in a number of different ways throughout what you've done in athletics and now what you're doing in the HR world. But I always like to give my guests an opportunity to shout out someone in their own life that has really been influential from a leadership perspective. Is there somebody that you'd like to give a shout out to today? Sure. Um, you know, I'll give a shout out to my, uh, my father. Um, his name is Marius Felix. Uh, he was an incredible athlete uh, in his day and uh, most incredibly humble person it kind of our family saying is humble hungry heart and that that humility and just that respect it just it flows through his veins and you know he always told me like just be the hardest working person in the gym and good things will happen for your teammates and for you so yeah shout out to him <laughs> a great way to end this conversation Tessa thank you so much for taking time to hop on the show today. I can't wait to see where your journey takes you in the future, but appreciate all the expertise and the guidance that you've given us today. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me.